Hey folks, this is Abel James and thanks so much for joining us on Fat Burning Man where we talk about real food and real results. Today we're here with Dallas Hartwig, the New York Times best-selling author of The Whole 30 and It Starts With Food. He also has a new podcast called The Living Experiment. If you're struggling to keep up with your phone messages, email, social media, and all the other craziness of the modern world without losing your mind, this show is for you. Upgrading your nutrition is only the first step in achieving your full potential, and we're about to explore how to improve your brain health, reduce stress, and get your sanity back with simple hacks to your daily habits. As you'll see on this show, technology can affect our health for better or worse. When you learn how to use technology as an opportunity to improve your health, modern advancements can change your life. So we started an online community with members from all over the world, and we have an exciting announcement. Allison and I are having a meetup, our first ever, in Austin, Texas during the Paleo Effects Conference coming up for members of the tribe. So if you'd like to meet me, Allison, and other members in person, we're going to have our first ever real-world party in Texas. We're still working out the details, but... I can't wait to meet you all in person. When you join the Fat Burning Tribe, you'll now get a new set of 30-day meal plans every month, which is a $47 value. You'll never have to worry about what you're cooking for dinner again. But more importantly, the Fat Burning Tribe is a community of people who are living the wild lifestyle. We're fat adapted. We're eating delicious things. We're also all over the world. But that connection when people are sharing the same way of eating and living is a very powerful thing to keep us all on track. So of all the things that I've built, I'm, I'm really proud of what the tribe is turning into. So I encourage you to check it out. You can change your life right now. So if you struggle to get started or if uh, you started, got results, and then gave up or found that eating this way or living this way was too tough to do on your own, we're here for you. And we want to help sincerely. So if you're ready to start eating delicious food and shedding stubborn fat by living wild, check out the Fat Burning Tribe. You can join us for a discount right now at fatburningtribe.com. One last time, that's fatburningtribe.com. All right, on to the show. On this unique show with Dallas, you'll learn why Bob Harper, host of The Biggest Loser, suddenly drinks bone broth. I've got some right here, actually. How Dallas healed a stubborn shoulder injury with real food. How to cultivate human connections that make you healthier, happier, and more productive, and much more. All right, let's go hang out in Dallas. All right, folks, Dallas Hartwig is a functional medicine practitioner, certified sports nutritionist, and licensed physical therapist. He's the New York Times bestselling author of The Whole 30, and it starts with food. In his free time... Dallas rides his motorcycles, snowboards, and mountain bikes, and occasionally enjoys a dram of single malt scotch. You're in good company, my friend. Dallas, thank you so much for being here, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So this is kind of cool. A few months ago, Bob Harper, the host of The Biggest Loser, he tweeted at both of us saying that he tried bone broth for the first yeah. time because he heard it from you on a past episode of this podcast. So it must feel awesome to see this really penetrating the mainstream in a lot especially when you get <laughs> mainstream celebrities to drink bone broth and eat totally. nose totally. to tail totally. that's like, cool yeah he, and he's a super good dude he's a personal friend of mine and like we banter back and forth about stuff and so i'll call like occasionally kind of like stick stuff in his brain bucket for future use <laughs> and it's kind of fun to see it like pop up later because i had you know like i didn't hear have any sort of real-time update on that so that was super sure. cool to see the world at large being more open to, to this stuff to nutritious food to the really the impact that lifestyle changes or lifestyle choices mm -hmm. massively impact your quality of life and i think that's something that it's a relatively new idea in the general public like they're like it is yeah like we've always known that you know exercise was important and that food was important but like i think it's really coming home for people that like yeah, what you do really matters, and it's way beyond just how many calories you eat and how long you do cardio for. Right. It's the true concept that that food is medicine, which isn't always something that you you employed yourself, right? I think your your story starts with hurting your shoulder or having yeah. a nagging injury that wouldn't go away, right? Oh. And you started looking around. So can you uh, talk about how you got into this whole mess? Yeah. So my background is healthcare. My um, my graduate degree is physical therapy, and I practiced for uh, for almost ten years. And I also played national level volleyball um, for a few of those years. And like as you say, had a, a nagging shoulder injury. And as a physical therapist, connected with some really good practitioners, it was frustrating to not be able to follow my own advice and get and get healthy and to yeah. heal. You know. So I had I, I struggled with a what I guess I'll call a shoulder tendonitis um, for over a year. And in that time period always kind of kept an eye sort of concurrently always kept an eye on current research 
as it pertained to rheumatoid arthritis, my mm-hmm. younger sister has, has RA. And like, I always kind of just was like, hey, cool. Like, I'll keep an eye on like new drugs, new protocols, new modalities, things that like might be helpful for her. Yeah. And literally by chance stumbled across a paper um, written by Lauren Cordain back, I think in 2002 or 2003. This was 2006 for me. Yeah. And I'm um, talking about uh, certain dietary proteins and how it affected autoimmunity, specifically for RA. And I was like, huh, inflammation, yeah. food, my shoulder. I wonder if those things are connected. And so really, really a, a, a total fluke maneuver there. And Lauren's paper was talking specifically about uh, dietary lectins in legumes. And I was like, at the time, I was sort of eating the like super healthy, lowish fat, some meat, lots of vegetables, you know, low fat dairy, lots of legumes, that kind of diet. So I was doing what I thought was pretty good. And I was lean and healthy and thought things were great, minus the fact that I couldn't get my shoulder to heal. Right. So I was like, well, I'll just try doing without legumes for a while because this guy says it might be a problem. And six weeks later, my shoulder was like, just healed, just done, like yeah. magic. And that was just really like at that time I had no idea about paleo or anything else, and so it was really was just the change of massively reducing or eliminating legumes altogether as a category. Mm-hmm. But like I was still doing dairy, I was still doing gluten. Like it was just that oh, one really? change. I didn't realize yeah. that you were. It was but just I, the well, legumes had, at first. I had no idea that that was even part of the same picture. You yeah. know. And so literally, it was just you know, it was a significant dietary change just because of what my previous diet was, but it wasn't doing the whole thirty or going paleo yeah. or any sort of more sweeping change. It was really just like, well, I'll change this one thing, and I was like wow, this is huge. I should pay attention to this. Yeah. And then I was like, you know, deep dive into nutrition as it affects inflammation because it was certainly relevant for my profession, you know, mm-hmm. sort of the, because of the time I'd been practicing at that point for coming up on six years and mm-hmm. was really kind of frustrated that what they taught me in school to be a good physical therapist didn't actually work particularly well, especially with chronic inflammation. Right. And I was like, oh, maybe there's m- other really important pieces here that certainly took me well outside the realm of physical therapy but that helped me as an individual and certainly as a, as a clinician view inflammation in a much larger way, um, sort of in a more macro way. Right. And that's really when it sort of became lots of nutrition reading, lots of primary research, which then eventually became seminar series. Man, that is so cool. So just the legumes, how many, what did your diet look like before that? Would you say, were you eating a ton of beans or? Um, probably multiple times a week. I wouldn't necessarily yeah. say every day, but yeah, I mean, I grew up, I was actually vegetarian until I went to college. Okay. Um, and uh, my parents viewed, uh, you know, being health as a, as a really important ideal. Mm-hmm. And um, when you grow up in the seventies, uh, like that was one of, thing, one of those things, like it's better for the earth, it's better for your body. You do right. complementary proteins, yada, yada. And so I grew up eating a ton of fresh, fresh, uh, you know, organic fruits and vegetables, mm-hmm. um, and lots of, lots of legumes and variations of that. And even some really awesome stuff like gluten patties and things like that. They were, <laughs> sure. you know, purportedly healthy things. <laughs> Performance uh, food. Miraculously, I survived to adulthood. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, so, and then I started eating meat in college and definitely felt better. It supported my activity a lot better, uh-huh. but it was still like boneless, skinless chicken breast and salmon and really, I mean, I was pretty good as far as the the food pyramid went, as far as like whole grains, mm-hmm. relatively little sugar, you know, low fat dairy, like that kind of stuff. Um, and for all intents and purposes, as best as I can tell, other than this nagging shoulder injury, I was healthy. You know, I was yeah. performed well as an athlete. I felt good. I slept good. I looked good. And I was like, cool, like I'm, I'm solid. Right. And then there was this one little like niggling like, oh, but what about this thing? Maybe not so much. Yeah. Uh, and then it was a whole new world because I was like, oh, I can feel so much better. Mm-hmm. And I was off and running. That's so cool. So what did it look like once you started eliminating the other problem foods? Well, so it took me, it really took me a couple of years to really kind of come around and really get into, because I mean, I, you know, read Dr. Cordain's book and kind of got into sort of the paleo stuff mm-hmm. fairly gradually over a year or two. Like it wasn't a like wake up one day and be like, I'm going to go paleo. Right. And at that point, I mean, the paleo community was such a small fringe thing Yeah. Um, that, you know, bumped into a few people who, who had kind of dabbled with it. Certainly, um, got a hold of Rob Wolf stuff right away because um, he was kind of one of the one of the biggest voices at at that point, and of course still is. So yeah. um, he was a major influence in kind of me learning more about that. But it really became it really was like my initial kind of dabbling in it, more reading and research on the evolutionary biology side of things. Mm-hmm. Then actually like, oh, other people do this too. Maybe I should learn from them. And that yeah. was really I'll you know, give Rob an enormous amount of credit um, for being a pioneer in that realm at that time. Yeah. Yeah, and and even now, I mean, I, what a great guy, what a great character, and there's so much meaning behind what he does. So I, it, it's uh, we were just talking before this interview about how awesome it is that 
we still all get together at the same conferences and totally. kind of reminisce about the good old days. And, well, yeah, it's funny. Like, I think now, I mean, I was just saying this, saying this to a friend the other day. I was like, it was almost 10 years ago that I had that sort of random discovered. Yeah. I'm like, you know, like that feels, it doesn't feel like that long, but yeah, I've been, I've been aware of nutrition as a focal point for human health for 10 years. So now there's a long and winding road between there and here, sure. but it's been fun. Now, over those 10 years, what are some of the most amazing things you've seen in terms of people healing themselves with their own nutrition? Uh, because, I, I, you know, a lot of people who are listening on the other end, some of them are very experienced, know exactly who you are. Other people are just kind of dipping their toes into it. And, uh, you know, at, at the beginning, when someone says that eating real food can absolutely change your life forever, you're like, yeah, right, dude, whatever. Totally. <laughs> so totally. what have you seen? Yeah, I mean, I've seen, I mean, the list, I'm, I'm not even sure I can come up with sort of a, a comprehensive list off the top of my head, but sure. like, I've seen, I mean, some of the most impactful things are things like people who are off all of their medications, right? right? So we see it, of course, with, you know, with the impact of um, improving metabolic health, we see people go off medications for diabetes all the time. Like that's mm -hmm. like standard fare, you know, right, to see right. people go off antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications mm -hmm. and sleeping medications to see people who are by sort of conventional diagnostic standards, no longer diabetic, you know? Yeah. And to me, and it, I'm kind of careful with sort of making claims of like, I cured their diabetes, but course, yeah. really what it comes down to is, you know, diabetes is a sort of, a, is a threshold diagnosis. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you alter the inputs, you don't actually approach those dangerous thresholds anymore. And sort of by diagnosis, like by diagnostic criteria, people are no longer diabetic. Lots and lots of people are no longer diabetic because of making some of these dietary changes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, understanding what the cost to sort of quality of life and just sort of in terms of medical costs, like that's literally millions of dollars in savings for a handful of people, you know, yeah. um, in terms of healthcare costs. Uh, there's things, there's a, a condition called trichotillomania, which is a, a compulsive hair pulling. And, um, you know, it's not a, not a particularly well understood condition. It's not super common. But yeah, we've, uh, we've had people who, you know, no longer have some of those, the, those compulsivities and, mm -hmm. and things that are like, profoundly powerful and influential in people's lives are alterable. And, you know, a lot of those conditions are things that, that conventional medicine has said, well, we'll treat you with some anti-anxiety medications or we'll treat you with something that alters your metabolic process or, you know, with some sort of psychoactive substance. But ultimately, you kind of have to level the playing field and go back to the baseline and say, how do we get the body to work right in the first place? Right. And in a sort of like, you know, not in a flippant way, but you could say that, you know, that my work has has cured cancer or gotten someone to the moon and i kind of wouldn't be surprised like it's just there's the impact is so enormous and you know there's there's this big influential stuff but honestly the thing that i think the most is the most gratifying for me is to talk to people every single week for mm -hmm. sure you know whether it's getting stopped on the street or just sort of you know people shoot me notes but people just say hey thanks for whatever and it's not a like you cured my diabetes or I have some sort of thing. It's like literally like you made my life better in some small way. And the thing that I'm most proud of is that it's often, I'll say it's actually really commonly a jumping off point for massive lifestyle change elsewhere. Yes, right? Like yes. that's, that's why I said it starts with food. That's the title of my first book. And so, because mm -hmm. I really feel like that's the most powerful jumping off point for this other sweeping changes, you know, in terms of quitting smoking, starting exercising, uh, examining your relationships, prioritizing sleep the way it should be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And so to see, like, I was just that one teeny tiny little catalyst for one teeny tiny little change that, that became sort of a much bigger thing down the road. It's, it's the butterfly effect, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's a fun thing to be doing. Like, that's a fun place to be because I take no credit for all the sequelae, right? Like, all right. the things that happen after that. I'm just like, it's just this one little thing and that's all I need to be. Isn't that so cool? And so in the, in the past few years, certainly in the past five or 10 years, things have changed enormously. Where do you see things going in the next five to 10? Well, I mean, it's certainly interesting because people really have, I think, developed, I say in general, it's hard because the world at large still needs this message. Yes. You know, the real food, you know, plants and animals, moderation, you know, call it paleo or not, it kind of doesn't matter. I'm like, look, eat plants and animals that still look like plants and animals. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't, and you know, people... People who don't really want to know what I do will ask me questions and they don't yeah. they really want to hear it. So I give them like, look, like, I'm like literally like eat meat and vegetables. Yeah. And they're like, well, well what about, I'm like, no, really just eat, like <laughs> eat meat and vegetables. Right. 
you know, because we make this so hard. So I think there's definitely an emerging awareness that food matters, that where it comes from matters. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, massively tribute Michael Pollan for being such a pioneer and such an advocate for, you know, food and food production and sustainability. Yeah, for a long um, time. Those are exciting, awesome movements um, that continue to grow. There's definitely more work to be done to get everyone to be aware of those ideas and those mm -hmm. concepts. But going forward, I see... Uh, I see, you know, certainly a lot more um, grass-fed, sustainable, organic, like responsibly produced products, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's sort of raw goods, like, you know, just sort of plants and animals kind of stuff, or whether it's more like packaged foods. I'm not a real fan of promoting or heavily promoting and heavily using kind of packaged foods, even if yeah. they're quote-unquote paleo, you know, yeah. and, and they, have a, they have a place, they have a role. But the reality is, is sort of inventing a new packaged food in place of the old crappy processed packaged food is yeah. a small step forward and a large step sideways. And I'd much rather see yes. people take a large step forward, you know. Right. But going forward, I think also, you know, you see it in the you see in the research, we definitely see this in sort of popular media of New York Times articles, Washington Post articles talking about uh, sleep talking about uh, the importance of social, you know, uh, social interactions, mm -hmm. the sort of cautionary tales with regard to the way we use technology. That's actually where I'm most interested in going. So I'm kind of looking around and saying, man, what needs to happen? You know, uh, I've done 150 something seminars on food. Like what else can I do? What other fun stuff can I do? And I look yeah. around like that's where this health movement needs to go is to look at other pieces besides food. You know, mm -hmm. and I think for me, my real interest now is, you know, what happens with the way we interact with each other on a person to person level in like a physically proximate way, you know, not yeah. so much how do we keep in touch with friends, you know, via text message and Facebook, but mm -hmm. how do we actually engage with people in a meaningful way and sort of a, in a, like a, what we call conversational distance, like literally like we're face to face, I can, you know, see you breathe, I can see the hair on your cheek, I can like see you like as a mm -hmm. human being and really kind of being present with that. And to a large degree, we've lost that. And I think, unfortunately, that comes at a much larger cost than anybody previously understood, but we're we're starting to realize is a real problem, you know. Yeah. So that's kind of that's where I see things going as far as a movement away from a focus on food and even sustainability and looking at the larger human as an organism and as a, as a social creature. Yeah, health and technology and where where human meets machine, I think, will be a fascinating totally. field. You know, really a whole field in the next few years. As you were talking about that, I'm just like, wow. South by Southwest just happened, and, and so right. there's been a lot of talk about virtual reality and right. you know quantifying your own health and that sort of thing. Uh, and, and it's going to be absolutely fascinating. I think you're going to have plenty of stuff to study in the next few years uh, as it relates to that. Because we, you know, my, my wife and I, over the past couple of years, we've been traveling almost nonstop. And uh -huh. one one piece of that was going out to the woods and just unplugging for weeks nice. on end, and so nice. zero internet which comes with its own problems in a lot of ways, especially when you have an internet business or when you're putting a podcast or whatever. I get it. I understand. <laughs> but, you know, you have a much deeper appreciation for both your own humanity and technology totally. when you completely get away from it. Yeah, and, and I'm, in, I'm super interested in the technology piece, not yeah. because I'm anti-technology, not because I think you should, you know, get rid of your phone and stop using email and throw away your computer, but, but, mm -hmm. I, but I'm increasingly suspicious of, of technology because it's not a passive tool, right? Mm -hmm. We think about the internet as a tool, as an amazingly powerful tool for, for sourcing data, for problem solving, for connection, but it's not like a hammer that sits there until you pick it up and use it, right? right. It's a portal, it's a gateway, it's an access point. And um, I think that even just thinking about that differently of saying, okay, how do I need to think about this if I recognize that this is not something that I am truly the master of? And I think all of us to a certain extent have experienced the fact that we're not truly the master of this thing. It has mm -hmm. profound influence over our behavior. Yeah. So my sort of cautionary tale is about making sure that something doesn't inadvertently, accidentally, subversively take over some little corner of your life without you even noticing. You yeah. know, and I think for a lot of us, that is exactly what's happened. Yeah. Certainly for me, you know, um, over the past, let's say, 10 years, technology is so integrated into my life that I didn't even know it was happening. And I look at it now and I'm like, oh, man, like, how did this happen? You know, yeah. and we did it willingly and rapidly and blindly. And I think now there's a lot of people, myself included, saying, hey, wait a second. Like, is this cool? Is this OK? And maybe it's not OK. And maybe we need to examine that much more critically. Right. So how do you personally what are your initial attempts, at least, to maintain your own humanity <laughs> and health 
yeah. in, in the world we live in now that's rapidly getting worse as it relates to, you know, yeah, how totally. entrenched so, we are with technology. For sure. For sure. Well, so, and, you know, I'm, I'm a work in progress. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to your point about having an online business, I'm the same, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I share information online. And at this point, I share information exclusively online. Yeah. So that's a challenge for sure. You know, and I think one of the ideas that I've really been kind of interested in the past, literally just this past few months, um, is sort of the balance between creation and consumption, right? Mm -hmm. Because hum humans are undoubtedly compulsive creators. Yeah. But we're also hardwired to consume things. And so in that sense, I, I don't think that either of those things are bad um, any more than eating is bad and exercising is good. It's really, a, it's really a ratio there. So in thinking about, you know, how we create and versus how we consume, uh, that's kind of how I, that's the lens through which I'm starting to view my own behaviors or, or the questions I'm starting to ask myself. Um, am, I con am I mindlessly consuming much more than I'm creating, yeah. you know? And if I am, that's where there needs to be a bit of a course correction so that I am spending more time in careful thought, in mindfulness, in creation, um, and less time just sort of mindlessly letting it wash over me. But, you know, some specific things, um, I have all my notifications on my phone turned off. My mm -hmm. phone never makes noise. The screen never lights up. The exception to that is if someone actually calls me, makes me, makes a phone call. Yeah. If you send me a text, nothing happens on my phone. Nothing, make, nothing makes noises. Nothing Right. It lights up like I can leave my phone on the table during conversation and have it never be disruptive because no screen comes on nothing lights up um, yeah. and that's you know been a really huge change um, just in terms of it being less disruptive you know right. um, I have to have my phone with me I do lots of business on it but ultimately less it can come to me and the more I have to go to it the mm -hmm. better and so yeah. I take that one step further where actually now my um my phone has a, has a place to live. It's like a landline. When it's at home, I don't carry it around. It's not in my pocket. It's not on the counter. It has a place tucked away that's essentially, it becomes a stationary place that I go to if I yep. want to use it, like the tool that it is, like the powerful tool that it is. Mm -hmm. But because it's silent and invisible and put away, it doesn't come to me. It doesn't yep. get to call out to me and say, hey, come look at Facebook or, you know, whatever. Right. So just that distance and sort of saying like, no, I'm really going to put it back in its place and make it a powerful tool, but not give it access to me and sort of make it a one-way street has been yeah. a really huge shift for me, for sure. Yeah. You know, uh, when we unplugged for a while there, that was like the number one thing that we loved was that all of a sudden it was instead of our uh, devices being active and constantly pulling at us, uh, you, you unplug for a while, you kind of reevaluate that and you're just like, why are all these things bleeping and blooping at us all the time? This is serving nobody. Absolutely. Really. It's just making well, it's us serving all somebody. It's not brain. serving you. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, and again, like that's not that's not like crazy conspiracy theory, but like right. it's designed that way. It's yeah. just it's not designed that way for your best interest. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, turning all that bleeping and blooping off and just using it as the wonderful tool that it is, you know, technology, phones, all these things. We have, you know, libraries in our pockets. We have we totally. can look up anything at any time. We can get in touch with anyone at any time. But it's worth having an actual phone call or getting together with that person in hopefully some sort of meaningful way more than like sending an emoticon over a text message. Right? Totally. Well, and I think it's actually funny, right? Like humans being social, you know, and um, when, you know, we first had T9 text, we just had alphanumeric characters, you know, mm -hmm. and somewhere along the way, someone was like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could actually give it some context and give it some emotion, which of course is how we came up with emoticons. But right. like even in digitizing communication, we reckon everyone recognizes the deficiencies and the, the limitations of that. And we're like, we give it this one little extra, like a little bit of humility or humanity in there where we give it some like neatly categorized graphical representations of emotion, which is mm -hmm. still not emotion, but it's, yeah, it's, it's part of that. I think the other thing that, that I think is, is super interesting is the way that we, um, like the way that it calls to us and we let it call, right? Yeah, like we yeah. let it kind of, you know, come at us. And that's a pretty universal thing. You know, mm -hmm. like, you know, everyone who, that I know anyway, that, that has access to phones, to smart, to social media, to the internet, uses it really quite often, you know? And, and I saw an interesting research piece the other day looking at what percentage sort of generationally use their phones in the presence of other people. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think a lot of, older folks, myself being older, I grumble at like other younger generation and how they're all super hyper connected. Yeah. But the data actually shows that generations, I'm 37, generations my age and older actually use their phones in the presence of other people considerably more than millennials and younger folks, which really? I thought, found really, yeah, right, surprising. I thought that was really interesting. And I think part of that's a statement to, a statement about 
there's sort of the universal allure of some of that some of that stimulation some mm-hmm. of that you know some of the entertainment piece of it the the, the stimulation almost addictive component yeah that it's not just because younger people grew up with it developmentally it's actually a pretty universal human thing and mm-hmm. even people who didn't weren't first exposed to it until their 30s, 40s, 50s, still have a large degree of brain, brain plasticity yeah. and still drill in those those neural pathways pretty rapidly so they become habits just as fast as anybody else. That explains Farmville. <laughs> <laughs> totally, right? I'm not playing Farmville. Somebody is. But yeah, no, that's a, that's a good example though. It's like, well, it, I mean, it all crumbles when you realize that it's literally brain scientists are coming up with this to make this stuff as addictive oh, as sure. possible, right? And that's uh, it's it's kind of the dark side. But let's let's talk a little bit about how you know the social connection piece is often ignored, especially when we're talking about health, right? If you if you yeah. nail down your diet and you finally get that body of your dreams, yeah. all of your life will be one hundred percent amazing forever, right? False. <laughs> False. False. So, but there's a whole social component, right? It doesn't matter how healthy you are if getting there means that you've cut off all social ties, which often happens, right? People give up eating with their friends, drinking totally. with their friends, what have you. So, how how do you cope with that? Well, I think, I mean, to your point, you know, I, I've sort of historically thought of the kind of the big three of you know, sort of health and fitness being nutrition, sleep, and movement, right? Mm-hmm. Like those are like the big, massively impactful pieces, and I I can't. It, it's four now. Like I just, I pull in. I, I can't think about the the value, or I can't think about like sort of human health overall without pulling that in as a as a top of the list kind of you know influence the, that that human social connection. Mm-hmm. And to your point, yeah, absolutely. People who you know um, have uh, restricted diets, or who are compulsive exercisers, or who um, have some of these like very strong beliefs and values and behaviors about health. Yeah, often alienate themselves from some of their historical, you know, kind of friends and family. However, like that's not usually, at least in my opinion, that's not usually what causes sort of the erosion of those social connections because they mostly didn't exist in the first place. It's not mm-hmm. like you had this really robust social network and then you decided right. to get healthy and lost all your friends. Usually right. what happens is you're socially isolated and lonely and self-medicating with food or exercise or alcohol or whatever else anyway, and you make some lifestyle changes – and you still need to address that social component. Yes, um, yes. And I think that's the piece that I really kind of want to help people do in sort of in, in bringing it out into light and calling it by its name and saying like, hey, listen, like a lot of us are lonely. A lot of us are, a lot of us feel like we don't have good social support networks. Mm-hmm. And that's a profound stressor on humans. You know, humans are, are tribal creatures. And, yeah. um, you know, being around people or having sort of friends and acquaintances or certainly having lots of online connections doesn't send your deep sort of the powerful subconscious part of your brain the message that like you've got people that have your back and that's what humans need yeah right humans need to know on a subconscious level someone's got my back when it matters when things get when things go sideways i'm okay and those relationships take time to develop like just time you mm-hmm. know um, not uh let's go bowling let's go have a drink after work like they just take massive amounts of time and we're all so bloody busy these days yeah and so by virtue of living in the modern world and having jobs and kids and whatever else, we lose big chunks of time that could or should be invested in a few close, very meaningful relationships. Yeah. Let me ask you this, because you've seen so many people and helped so many people to truly transform their own lives. But one of the biggest things that happens that's kind of, people don't realize it until they start having success there, that there are problems that come with success. Yeah. Right? In a lot of cases, you see someone transform completely their health is better than it ever has been. You know, uh-huh. maybe they do have the body of their dreams or, or, or what have you. But all of a sudden they realize that the social component suffers enormously because of that. Because all of a sudden you realize it's not as much fun to hang out with all your drinking friends when you're not drinking. And they're not nearly as funny when you're not drinking or whatever, right? Or, you know, sometimes it can be a little bit more tragic than that where someone might not believe in your success, might not trust it, might think that you're part of a new cult now. So how do you, especially if you do have success with the the personal transformation piece, which you kind of have to do that first, right? How do you then cope with making sure that you are maintaining or cultivating new positive social relationships? Well, it's interesting, you know, because I used to think about it very much the way you just said, where you sort of have to kind of do some of those, this sort of the personal transformation stuff first. I'm kind of turning my whole world upside down and questioning even that, you know, even the whole like it starts with food concept um, in terms of impact, just sort of sheer physiological impact on your long term health. I don't think anything supersedes food. However, I'm not sure that necessarily needs to be the same 
chronological process. So the like hmm, okay. degree of impact and the chronological order are not necessarily the same thing. Yeah. And from a sort of like self-efficacy, success, belief in yourself kind of perspective, making sweeping food changes and having massive improvements hugely impacts your belief that you can do other things and do other things well. Right. I don't think it's the only way. And I'm increasingly starting to wonder whether prioritizing the human connections that sort of start to downregulate the stress response to sort of dampen and stabilize that, mm -hmm. you know, of course, the, the chronic stress response being at the core of, of most chronic disease um, and certainly chronic inflammation, being able, able to sort of moderate and stabilize that is a huge, is a huge long-term direct or indirect influence on human health. Right. And a lot of the behaviors that we do, including things like excessive or compulsive exercise or uh, extraordinarily restrictive dietary approaches, um, some of those things come out of actually really unhealthy psychological places, right. uh, you know, yeah. driven by that chronic stress response. So in some ways, I almost wonder whether people could be more moderate and more lo more successful long term with some of those lifestyle changes if they had the benefit of having sort of this additional robust social network on mm -hmm. the side augmenting all of the other changes they make. So it doesn't necessarily change my recommendations, but it's shaken things up for me. I'm still developing that, you know. People don't really talk about it that much, right? It's it's no, certainly something yeah, that deserves a lot more attention. Yeah, it definitely deserves a lot more attention. That's really, to be completely honest, that's my primary interest right now. That's hmm. the, you know, when I read primary research, I'm reading about, you know, social connection, social isolation, loneliness, depression, anxiety, sleep. Um, I'm reading about that complex of stuff. I'm looking at, you know, hormonal responses with, you know, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and mm -hmm. oxytocin, and vasopressin, like all these kind of interesting, you know, neurotransmitters and hormones that are directly impacted by face-to-face -face human interaction, yeah. human touch, speaking to each other, feeling supported, you know, and there's a ton of really great research on that, but it's hard to extrapolate out to be like, here's a really hard and fast, simplified recommendation because right. it's complex, it's complex, yeah. complex, complex, you know, but the guiding principle is we've gone awry and we need to do better with this topic. And that's like, I want to really champion that topic. I mean, I'm working now I'm in the early stages of working on a documentary film on, oh, on cool. that specific topic. Yeah. Uh, I don't know anything about making films. I'm connected with a really <laughs> awesome producer. Um, nice. thank goodness. Um, but yeah, I want to, I want to champion this topic. I want this to be a thing that, that everyone is more aware of. Like you look at the food movement where mm -hmm. people are like, yeah, like I need to start paying attention to this. I'm a long ways from having any sort of neat and tidy set of answers. I don't expect that'll ever happen. Yeah. But I want to I want to megaphone this conversation to make it much bigger and much louder because I really feel like in terms of impact on human health and turn in terms of impact on society at large, the way we have deprioritized meaningful face to face human relationships mm -hmm. and increasingly prioritized technology, um, I think that the impact is on the order of smoking. You know, yeah. not not in terms of kind of direct deaths, but in terms of like in 10 years, we're going to look back and say, wow, we really screwed that up. Yeah. And and everyone's going to know. I mean, we already like everyone I talk to, I'm like, yeah, we're like something's wrong. And everyone's like, yeah, I already know. Like, I don't have to make a really strong scientific data, you know, backed mm -hmm. up uh, kind of case. I'm like, look, we did this. We're doing this thing wrong. And everyone's like, yeah, I know. I feel it, you know. Right. And so 10 years from now when the data is stronger and we've been dealing with this for a whole another decade, this is going to be a, a thing that everyone is aware of. And I want to like massively contribute to that conversation. Yeah, it's a it's a beautiful thing. And uh, I can personally attest that the, the social component is huge. When my wife and I were traveling around, we were living a lot of times in seclusion as well. And so we like we were when we were in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. The closest town, you know, was basically an hour away. There were a couple oh, wow. of little you things. Were we were way out there. Okay. So all of a sudden, you at the beginning, it's wonderful, right? You, you shake the city off. You totally, totally decompress. It's it's quiet. And then after a while, you're just you find yourself talking to the dog a lot. All of a sudden, you're like making excuses to go down to the post office just to like <laughs> see if anyone's there and start okay. a conversation. You can definitely, you know, we let ourselves get a get a huge taste of that and you know, kind of like circling back around into our more normal lives now. It's wonderful to be able to cultivate social yeah. connections once again and reconnect with old friends and make new ones. And it's something that 
you know, especially when you're <laughs> gallivanting around the world or something or traveling, people don't really talk about the value of those social connections that are meant to stay in place or, or a number of people that you should intentionally try to have a relationship with. Yeah, and it takes time. It takes work. Like it's it, not something that just sort of like happens. Like right. it takes actual time and work. And especially for dudes, we're awful. <laughs> we're terrible. Like you were like, oh, I sent him a text three months ago. We're still friends. You know, right, yeah. like, you know, like it's close enough. No, I think you're. I think you're right. But you think about the way the world was, you know, a few hundred years ago, where most people lived in small, you know, small villages, small mm-hmm. towns, um, where they knew a lot of their neighbors, you know, often they knew everyone within a few miles of them. And they'd lived there probably for multiple generations, they knew their families and they didn't have to work to spend time in their community with people around them because right. when you needed meat, you went to the butcher and you talked to the butcher because that's right. where you meet, you know. And now we have to sort of reverse engineer that and say, no, I actually need to develop and build in specific time to, to you know, to spend meaningful time with people. Um, and so in a way, you know, if you view it from sort of an evolutionary biology lens, which is kind of how I, I view the world, you know, you look at sort of it's a little bit analogous to the way we make changes with food. Mm-hmm. We don't have to be like we need to do, you know, we don't have to hunt and kill all of our and butcher all of our own animals, but we still need to kind of keep an eye on the fact that a long time ago that's what we had to do. And so the right. closer we get to that and sort sort of that like balance of how the world works now and sort of taking advantage of some of the convenience without letting the convenience and the technology take away from what's meaningful with that mm-hmm. experience, right? Without turning the, you know, without turning the food into, into a refined processed modern food. And I think the same is true of technology, right? The, the analogy holds true. We take meaningful human connection and we digitize it and we think it's the same and it's not the same. Right. Yeah. And it, it reminds me also of the way that we have to, the way that we had to invent exercise and then kind of artificially right. insert it into our lives yeah, again yeah, when totally. we lost that it's it seems like we're losing the same thing but with the social aspect of living now i'll argue we haven't it's not losing we've lost it right like we feel like unless i'm way out alone on this one but like i talk everyone i talk to is like yeah like there's a there's a hole there where something awesome used to be you know mm-hmm. and that's not sort of a romantic sentimentalism that's a like a recognition that as humans as as organisms, we're not behaving in a group or individually in a way that matches what we need, you yeah. know? And if we're doing it better with food, if we're doing better with exercise and we're kind of mimicking and um, and echoing some of those ancient patterns, awesome. We need to do the same with the way we connect with other people. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful thing. Well, I this went in such an awesome direction. I'm stoked that we get to talk about this. Uh, Dallas, where can people find you? I am launching a website. Uh, I think by the time this this airs, actually, it'll be up and rolling. So it's awesome. DallasHartwig.com. I'm also on uh, Instagram and Twitter at Dallas Hartwig. Uh, I'm on Facebook and I'm various other places around, including random podcasts. So awesome. here, and, here and there and everywhere. <laughs> well, Dallas, your work is cut out for you. Uh, I think this is uh, one of the most interesting subjects there is. I, I definitely share your enthusiasm in a lot of ways. So thanks so much for coming by, being generous with your time and uh, telling us about what you do, because this is, it's a very exciting time. And uh, if there's anything I can do to support you, just let me know. Well, thank you for spreading this message. I think it's important and you're doing great work. Thanks, man. Hey, awesome. Thanks again for listening to Fat Burning Man. Don't forget, before you go, Check out fatburningtribe.com. If you have a question for me that you want answered about how to improve your performance, what to eat for dinner, how to drop fat quickly, how to improve your overall health, or anything else, we answer all of your questions there. So quickly, you can get the first month for just $1 for a limited time. Check it out at fatburningtribe.com. All right, I'll see you there. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Fat Burning Man. If you liked it, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, the podcast app, or wherever else you might be listening to or watching this show. Got a second? Please leave me a quick review on iTunes. I always love hearing from you, and if you think someone else might like and benefit from this free show, please take a second to share it with a friend or with a family member. You can get in touch with me on Twitter at FatBurnMan and Facebook by typing in Abel James or FatBurningMan. Drop me a line anytime. 
Did you know that I've recorded over 150 episodes of Fat Burning Man, winning four awards in independent media and hitting number one in more than eight countries? And here's some more good news. You can download and listen to every single episode for free. All you have to do is type in fatburningman.com. I'll give you a second to type it in, fatburningman.com. And you'll get all the show notes and video and audio versions for all the past episodes of Fat Burning Man. Better yet, enter your best email at fatburningman.com, sign up for my newsletter, and I'll even send you a quick start guide to start burning fat right now and a few of our ridiculously tasty recipes as a special thanks for signing up. Once again, just go to fatburningman.com right now, enter your best email to get your free fat burning download straight to your inbox and make sure that you never miss a show again. This is Abel James signing off. Thanks so much for listening and have a great week. Five, 348, 342, 345. They never really improve, even though they're out there training hard and doing the work. Well, I'm saying, look, if you, if you're, if this is your pursuit, you ought to be getting better every single marathon you race mm-hmm. until you're 40.